We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. Lock your doors, close the blinds, change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Robert Mazel, and we do a deep dive into the world of drug cartels and money launderers as we discuss his book, The Betrayal. Just before we begin, we now have a YouTube channel. I've been threatening it for a while and now we have it. So please follow the link below in the show notes and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And there are video versions of the podcast. So if you like to see a squiggly line with your interviews, you can now see a squiggly line on YouTube. If you wish to support the podcast, there are a few options for you. You can become a Patreon subscriber and directly support the show for £3 a month. We also have a merchandise store at Redbubble. We have cups, coasters, water bottles, and tote bags all available on the Redbubble store. Also, if you enjoy this episode, please share it on social media among friends, family, colleagues, cohorts. And lastly, please leave a review on your podcast app. All reviews help the show get discovered by other people. Apple Podcasts in particular love reviews, and they really help this show get featured on the app. So please do leave a review. All the links are available in the show notes below. Thank you so much for your support. And without further ado, let's get going. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Robert, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, it's an honor to have you on because uh, you are quite a legendary individual and, uh, and you were famously played by Brian Cranston in that excellent film, The Infiltrator. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's quite a man. I, I tell you, I, I got an opportunity to deal with him quite often and um, he's down to earth. He's very sincere. Um, money hasn't changed him. And um, very considerate of me and my family. Actually, he spent a lot of time speaking with me, but not just me, my my wife and my children, because he wanted to get the uh, the real feel for the impact of the family in the film. Yeah, yeah, and it was an excellent film, and I think it actually caught that very well, that side of things. So, for the benefit of listeners, please can you just sort of tell us a little bit about your yourself and your sort of early life before sort of getting into high risk undercover operations. Sure. Um, well. You know, I, I wasn't planning on becoming a law enforcement officer. I, in college, took uh, business administration finance, and I was one class short of getting an accounting degree. And I wound up taking a, a summer job that also offered for the senior year some part-time employment with an agency at that time called the IRS Intelligence Division, which mm. I jokingly say is somewhat of an oxymoron, but ac- actually <laughs> it, it's now known as the Criminal Investigations uh, of IRS. And I, I didn't even know what they were. Uh, I, as I got in and I did the interview, the guy uh, educated me to uh, understand that uh, they're, the, they're the agents who worked with other agencies to put Al Capone behind bars. They worked on organized crime figures, drug traffickers, corrupt politicians. I mean, they did other criminal cases too, but they, they focused on that developing uh, tax evasion cases against um, criminals who didn't report their illicit income. And and when I was in the office, <laughs> I didn't have tremendous responsibility at, uh, as a co-op student. I made coffee and copies. and um, But I did hear and, and, and observe a lot of what they were doing. And at the time, they were working on a case uh, on a, a guy by the name of Frank Lucas, who was the biggest heroin dealer in New York, and was uh, played by Denzel Washington uh, in in um, American Gangster. Oh yeah, yeah. 
And um, what they were doing is they were working the money laundering side and they were doing surveillances at a bank where his couriers were bringing literally army duffel bags full of cash to the bank. And um, the bank was aptly named Chemical Bank uh, for a drug case. <laughs> and, uh, and so they developed the evidence and went after the bank and the bankers. And that caught my uh, focus 100% because I saw the direct line between the criminal proceeds and the command and control at the very top of criminal organizations. And I weighed, okay, do I want to be a CPA and count widgets or does this sound more interesting? And it certainly sounded more interesting. So I, that was my, I I got offered a position as a special agent with um, the IRS intelligence division after I graduated. And I stayed with that agency for 11 years until I moved over to customs, which is now the Homeland Security Investigations Office Mm. within the Department of Homeland Security, and then on to DEA. Wow, fantastic. Well, what led you to wanting to work these sort of high-risk undercover operations? I I think all all people drawn to the law enforcement community, at least 99 plus percent, um, they, they become a part of that because they want to be part of making a difference. And in my mind, Part of make, making a difference meant getting in the trenches and getting as close to the criminal activity as one could in order to get the evidence that couldn't be obtained in any other fashion. And I had no interest in going into management. I didn't want to ride a desk. Uh, I wanted to stay on the street. And as I began to, uh, fortunately for me, for the most part, in the first half of my 27 years of my career, I didn't do uh, long-term undercover. Uh, I was assigned when uh, it came close to my starting um, working undercover. I was working on a task force that was responsible for attempting to identify the command and control of those organizations laundering for the Medellin cartel and to try to take out the money launderers and as much of the assets as we possibly could. And as we tried to do that, and we were uh, mildly successful, we realized that we needed a new tool in our toolbox. And that new tool was the long-term undercover technique. So um, I, no officer in any agency that I'm aware of can be forced to do that. They have to volunteer. And so I volunteered uh, to be a long-term undercover agent, knowing full well we wanted to fill a position of someone who could play the role of a corrupt businessman who had the capability of laundering large amounts of illicit funds. And most of my colleagues were criminal justice majors. And I was, on the other hand, I had the financial background in training. And plus, on two summer jobs, I worked in a bank and I worked in a brokerage firm. So I knew financial markets and I felt, you know, that gives me less that I have to lie about. So (laughs) the first step of after you volunteer is you are uh, given a barrage of psychological testing Somehow I slip through. <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> what they look for, so I hear in simple terms, is somebody who sees things black and white, not a lot of gray rationalization, um, right, wrong, one, two, there's no in-betweens. So then I went on to going through actually two undercover schools. And um, that, in my view, saved my life not only from the standpoint of having honed the tools to become, for me, my most effective version of a long-term undercover agent, but also to understand the impacts that this abnormal reality (laughs) was going to have on me and my family and what things were best to be in place in order to get through this whole thing at the end and be whole and be whole with my family. And I'm forever indebted. As a matter of fact, I am so grateful. I just got notified yesterday (laughs) um, by now Homeland Security Investigations that they have asked me to become a part of the training group that works with new long-term undercover agents. And I told them, you know, (laughs) okay, you're not the private sector. I know you're not going to pay the way the private sector does. So, but this is a way for me to give back to one of the agencies that made my life today 
possible. Um, so it's an extremely important and meaningful um, event <laughs> for me. So, um, and then it goes on from there, but I'll let you ask some questions to point me in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, thank you for that. And, and well done on that appointment. That sounds great. You're going to be sort of influencing a whole sort of generation of uh, hopefully new sort of undercover officers. That's brilliant. Thank you. So um, let's talk a little bit about organized crime, who are sort of your target, so to speak. Can you give us a sort of dummy's guide to organized crime, the drug trade, and illicit finance? Well, organized crime is a is a broader uh, concept than just drug cartels, um, because you know we we deal with the traditional um, organized criminal organizations that have a menu of criminal activity that include drug trafficking. And, and truly, the, the Mexican and the Colombian cartels have expanded their menu some, although their specialty is drugs. Um, one thing I, I must say that with regard to the underworld and the coordination between criminal organizations, I wish whatever it is that they magically have to be able to work so well together was is somehow turned into a vaccine that we in the United Nations could take and, <laughs> and, and in the free world could take because we don't seem to get along. They get along tremendously. Um, yeah, I've always been fascinated by that. I've always been fascinated <laughs> by that. There's, got to, there's a book in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, today, the Mexican cartels, the Colombian cartels, and Hezbollah, um, mm. and a few other uh, terrorist organizations probably are the nucleus of the drugs moving into North America and Europe, except for the fact that they rely extraordinarily heavily, um, as most drug organizations do, on the Chinese triads that control the unregulated pharmaceutical companies within the People's Republic of China. And it's from there which the cartels obtain the precursor chemicals and fentanyl and, and other drugs that are then distributed um, through the Mexican cartels who then in turn work with gangs uh, that are just um, peppered all over uh, the world uh, distributing. So, but criminal organizations, you know, have a clear structure. Um, there are command and control at the top. You know, in the Medellin cartel, it was Pablo Escobar who sat on the and was the, the chairman of the board of the board of the Medellin cartel that included um, many other families, including, you know, the Ochoa family, Rodriguez Gacha. Um, there were there were quite a few others. And and then underneath them, uh, each of them had their own, as the Italian groups call them, you know, their their own crews. And and they in turn. You know, everyone pays tribute up to the bosses um, and uh, they are given as much resource opportunity as possible. And, and what they really do gain from the people at the top, the, the captains and the consigliere and the capos and, and, and the godfather is the power of corruption because these organizations control presidents, they control generals, they control, in some areas, judges, they, we can look at just current events, it should scare everyone into focusing more on this. We have so many crises around the globe, it's hard for the average person to remember these things. But it was just a, f a week or two ago, that we extradited the former, very recently former president of Honduras. He had just finished serving his term when the Drug Enforcement Administration uh, requested his extradition, which was accomplished a couple of weeks ago. He now faces life in prison for his facilitating by allowing his country to become the gateway of drugs and money for Mexican and Colombian cartels. But his brother, was already convicted and is doing a life sentence. Some 10 senators from Honduras are, many business people are. That same scenario is um, unfortunate when we look at 
many other countries, but just let's take a look at Mexico. In 2021, the Drug Enforcement Administration was feverishly attempting to identify who this mysterious person who everyone referred to as El Padrino, serving the Mexican, a Mexican cartel, facilitating their movement of drugs and enabling them to get very sensitive law enforcement information. Ultimately, they identified who that was. They arrested him in California near the end of 2021. He, in fact, was the Minister of Defense of the country of Mexico, Gen General Salvador Sinfuegos. We held him without bond. And during the end of the Trump administration and under Attorney General Barr, the current president of Mexico um, screamed on behalf of the Mexican government, saying that what had occurred was a violation of the Mexican sovereignty and that they should be given the opportunity to bring this person, if they were in fact guilty, uh, to justice within their own borders. The political pressure was put on very heavy. It's interesting when you look at the recent testimony last two years of the El Chapo Guzman case, the same president who was making these demands of getting Sinfuegos back was alleged by witnesses to be the recipient of large amounts of payoffs from Mexican cartels. But so we gave him back under that pressure. And within 30 days, they determined that there had been no offenses by General Sinfuegos. He was innocent and all charges were dropped. That's the power that organized crime can bring to the members of their organizations, and it happens every day. Yeah. Can you um, talk to us sort of about the, the money laundering side of things? Because quite a few legitimate sort of businesses and banks end up playing a role in that. Yes, and that's actually what drove me after going through Operation Sea Chase mm. um, and uncovering the involvement of what was then the seventh largest privately held bank in the world, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI, you know, in a feverish pl corporate plan to solicit illicit deposits from every walk of crime. Um, as I got the opportunity to debrief those convicted officers who were sitting in jail with a 12-year sentence, which to the drug traffickers is probably you know a vacation, but for a banker, uh, that's not a vacation. Um, I've spent a lot of time in jail, thank goodness, only visiting. Um, but I can tell you it's not a, uh, in the United States, it's not a happy place to be. And I can tell you in the UK, it's sometimes even worse. I've heard some terrible stories <laughs> uh, about that. But I have to say, I am so enthralled. I'm so uh, envious of the, the British system of justice because I've testified in the Old Bailey and when the man was found guilty, we had a recess, we came back, the judge imposed the sentence, and he walked down the stairs of the dock into the prison and began serving his time. That doesn't happen here. <laughs> I, I was really impressed uh, with, with that. But, but uh, you know, getting back to, to, um, to your, your earlier question, I saw that there is, in fact, a segment of the international banking and business uh, community and the legal community that routinely serves the interests of the underworld. And it was clear to me through debriefing the, the bankers at BCCI that what they were doing was not an anomaly. They made it very clear that they had worked in prior uh, banks. And, and what they did is they took as an institution what they thought were the best techniques to serve clients who had money seeking secrecy from governments. The question is who's seeking, who's got money seeking secrecy from governments? And it's not just drug dealers. It's um, people who want to massively evade income taxes. It's people who want to pilfer treasuries. It's people who want to deal with prohibited nations uh, that have been sanctioned. It's people who deal illegally in arms. It's, it comes from all walks of crime, white collar crime, you name it. Mm, mm. And But the same type of um, techniques need to be used to serve clients who have that need to, to create veils of secrecy and to conceal and disguise the true source of illicit funds so that it can flow into the real world and then 
become part of the, the real world's economy, giving therefore the criminals legal fronts by which they can defend themselves for where their wealth comes from. Mm. Here's a silly question. Why is illicit money important? Because there's some people out there who might just think that, um, you know, this isn't really a big deal. It's just, you know, it, it's, uh, it's the government just trying to get more money out of people or whatever. Well, I wish I could um, whisper in the ears of the more than 107,000 Americans who died in 2021 from the abuse, the abuse of illegal drugs, two thirds of them mm. abusing fentanyl. If they had only realized that their addiction fueled the bank accounts of those who then in turn flood our streets with these illicit drugs and kill kids. And at the same time, these criminal organizations undermine democracies and steal the rule of law from many countries. And so it's not just that hit. It's not just that nightly high that uh, they're dealing with. It's the death that they are creating in the community. It's the undermining of um, democracies. And it, it's also the violence that occurs. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, why do people join these gangs like MS-13? I mean, these are murderers. Um, if you live in Central America or even North America, and you lived in an underserved, underprivileged community, and there's a higher presence of MS-13 members, and your 11-year-old son is trying to improve his education and get out of that, but he's then confronted by gang members who make it very clear that he's got one choice, death or work with the gang. Or, and it's not just your death, son, it's your mom and dad's death, your grandmother and grandfather's death, your sisters and your brothers all dead. So you join us. And you know that happens at an older generation level as well. True story in Mexico. Now, houses of exchange, casas de cambio, in Mexico and in Latin American countries and in countries all over the world really do serve underprivileged people who don't have bank accounts who need to move funds like migrant workers to their families back in their homeland. But they are also very, very adaptable for money laundering. So a couple, an elderly couple in Mexico that controlled a casa de cambio that was not working with illicit funds was visited by a very well-dressed gentleman in a suit who explained that he was there on behalf of Los Zetas. Los Zetas is a very violent Mexican drug cartel, actually former military special forces in Mexico. And um, so they said to him, you know, we have an offer and it's uh, silver or lead. We can either have you killed or with lead, or you can make money by getting a percentage for what you move for us. And by the way, take a look at this picture. This is the, your, your granddaughter leaving school, and that school is so close to that big highway. And wouldn't it be horrible if one of those 18-wheeler trucks went out of control and ran her over? So are you going to work with us or not? So, you know, from that nightly hit, mm. all of that horror evolves yeah and i think there's, there's one thing i've always found interesting with people who are drug users is they they somehow feel their behavior just because they're dealing with like a low-level drug dealer on the streets of london or something they feel like their their purchase just doesn't really have an impact but it does doesn't it absolutely it does yeah there's a lot of sort of casual drug users in the uk and and i've always just found it amazing that people just don't consider how their action is affecting things it really it always amazes me so um yeah yeah thank you for that so you've mentioned it already operation sea chase uh, can you talk to us about how you joined sort of u.s customs and a little bit about the legendary operation sea chase well when i was initially in law enforcement in the criminal investigations division of uh irs I was on a joint task force with what was then the U.S. Customs Service Office of Enforcement, now the Homeland Security Investigations. And we worked shoulder to shoulder in the same room. Half of us were IRS with forensic accounting backgrounds. The other half were customs 
uh, enforcement officers who had more of a um, criminal justice type background. And we were working on trying to attack money laundering. And as I got to work with them more and more, um, <laughs> I remember I wanted to get a search warrant in a case. And I'm still an IRS agent, even though I'm on that task force. So I've got to go through about, oh, seven or eight levels of administrative review for my affidavit for a search warrant before I can use it. And under U.S. law, you know, you've got to have information that's considered to be relatively fresh. You've got to have evidence that within 30 days where you want to search is where evidence of a crime was. Well, by the time the review finished, you know, 30 days was pretty much close to up. And so I, I talked to the customs agent and I said, you know, this is really, you know, what do you guys do? He goes, I write the affidavit. I then go to the home of the magistrate. He reads it. He either approves it or doesn't approve it, he or she. And then I go do the search. And I said, well, I think I need to be in the customs service. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I applied and I was accepted and I went through their training and, and, um, and that's how I got there. Um, and, and then as I began to work in the custom service, I learned more about their undercover school program and the opportunity to use that technique, uh, in money laundering cases. So I volunteered to be a, uh, a long-term undercover agent and they accepted me and trained me. And part of the training is learning how to write to prepare basically the business plan, the undercover ops plan that is going to be put forth by you for the purposes of getting authorization to um, get what we call an attorney general's exemption in the United States, that being the attorney general, him or herself, actually authorizes an operation that requires you to commit a crime to commit those crimes, only the crimes that you're, you're given the authorization for. So I knew how to pair, you know, I knew how to address, okay, what resources do we need? What funding do we need? What will be our plan of action? What equipment do we need? What kind of recording will we be using? Who will the personnel be? All these different types of things that need to be in the, uh, in the plan. And initially, uh, you know, I drafted and proposed Operation Sea Chase. At the time, it was a two-step undercover operation because in in customs or HSI or uh, in most agencies, the case agent who's responsible for overseeing the entire operation is not the undercover agent. You have too many administrative responsibilities, too many things that need to be done. So initially, I didn't do undercover when we launched the operation. My partner, um, who is a tremendous undercover agent, far, far more naturally talented than me, Amir Abreu, the best undercover agent I've ever worked with. He's a street kind of guy who, when he walks in a room, no one thinks anything other than, I wonder what crimes he commits. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so... I, on the other hand, had to have all kinds of documentation and things and convince people, but, <laughs> but Amir is like a natural. So, um, so in the first four or five months, our plan of action was for Amir to tell through an informant some targets within the Medellin cartels money laundering systems that he could get accounts open and help them to launder. But there was a money limitation um, because the accounts were opened by his boss, but his boss put restrictions. His boss never wants to meet any of them. He wants to stay in the shadows. He's afraid he's going to get in trouble. And um, But if you could ever convince him to come out of the shadows and work with you, you there would be rivers of money that you could launder. But I, I just he, he just doesn't want to do it. So within three or four months, they were begging to meet me. I was, I was the one who was going to play Mr. Big if that, would, if that developed. And so at that stage, I handed off the case agent responsibility um, to a lady who was a tremendous case agent. And, and then I assumed the lead undercover role and managed the undercover operation, which operated in about eight cities mm -hmm. in the United States, in the UK, 
and France um, and Costa Rica. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And people should uh, check out your book on that and also the movie with Brian Cranston about it as well because it's a very interesting, interesting operation. So um, what motivated your move from working with U.S. Customs to the DEA and how was the DEA sort of different from working at U.S. Customs? Um, I have to take you to the last couple of months, like the last... Four, four or five months of the Operation Sea Chase. At that time, I was called to a meeting and I was told that the operation would be ending in October of that year. It was June. And I was very confused because our operational plan and agency procedures generally call for a monthly review to determine whether or not you're meeting new bad guys and you're getting additional evidence of other crimes. And if you are, you continue. If you don't, you should stop because you're facilitating crime um, by being a part of this criminal organization. And I felt that there there was no clear picture for why it was to be ending. And in October, we're in June. And um, so at that stage, I, you know, I faced reality, it's going to go down. And, and, and I just tried to get in that last four or five months um, I tried to get two years worth of work done in that period of time. Um, and when it was over, um, I later began to hear rumors that this was a decision that had been made at the highest levels because there was a presidential election in November and that, um, this was going to be the October surprise that caused, um, the voting public to realize that the administration was hard on drugs. And, um, you know, I would never be allowed in meetings where something like that was, was discussed, but I was told that by mid-level managers that it, that it occurred. But as now we're going, you know, once the indictments are, are returned, that's when the work really begins. And we needed to go to trial. We needed to prepare. We needed, we needed our entire team. We had about 14 people. We needed that whole team intact and we needed to continue to work. We had 1,200 recordings that needed to be transcribed. We had done searches. We, we had taken records from BCCI in London, BCCI in Paris, BCCI in Miami. We had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of records that needed to be analyzed. And what I witnessed as we were feverishly trying to prepare was that slowly the resources were being taken off of the case. And I complained about it vehemently. I wrote memos about it. I confronted management about it. And I wasn't very popular uh, as a result. And as a matter of fact, I received a phone call from the highest ranking person within the US Customs Office of Enforcement, the Assistant Regional Commissioner in Washington, who said to me, Bob, you know, your, your capabilities in financial investigations is, is better than any. And we, we want you here in Washington now to take over the financial division. I said, excuse me, sir, but, um, there's 1200 recordings that need to be transcribed. We're losing resources every day. The, de- it, the worst thing I could do, and it would be a horrible embarrassment to the agency is if we weren't prepared for trial and we lost because I knew and later confirmed the defense had hired the highest paid lawyers you could find had spent more than $24 million preparing for battle. And the department of justice opposed my being transferred. Um, but the word was made quite clear, you know, the day will come when the trials are over. And at that stage, um, you know, we'll do what we want to do. So I, I went through the trial processes. The longest trial was six months. I was on the witness stand in that trial from the middle of March to the middle of June. I was on the, uh, the, in the, in the dock every day for three months, um, on direct and cross examination. I testified in, in the old Bailey in two different matters, um, in magistrates courts, um, and in a few in the United States. And when that was over, um, just around that period of time, the gentleman who's in charge of the, the Drug Enforcement Administration office in Tampa uh, and I had a conversation. He said, you know, would you consider coming to our agency? I knew I had a target on my back. Mm. And um, and I said, well, you know, what what's your idea? And he said, well, we'd love to do 
another operation like Sea Chase, we'd like you to be the long term undercover. And if you come to the agency and you get through Quantico and you get through all of the training, then um, then then that's what's in the cards. Now I had been through the debriefing of the BCCI officers. I knew that there was this significant segment of the financial world that continually worked with the underworld and I wanted to get them. And this was my opportunity. So I said, yes. And um, that was an interesting endeavor because I, I showed up at Quantico at age 41 and most of the, most of the other people who were, uh, in my class were close, much closer in age to my son than they were to me. And, uh, I kind of became the father of the group. Um, uh, but I, I'm proud they, they, they elected me the, the class, uh, representative who's the person who gets to speak on their behalf to the trainers, the drill sergeants and all of the, the, uh, the people who are involved. I say drill sergeants, they act like drill sergeants, but DEA is much more paramilitary. Uh, than uh, the U.S. Customs Service, they are uh, much more um, blood and guts. I guess is a, is a term I can think of. Um, every every group. I was in a group. Every group. Um, each each group probably had one or two major events each month where you're crashing down doors and running through with machine guns and doing searches in high risk places. And, um, it's, it's very tactical. Um, and so this type of an operation, which became uh, dubbed operation promo, which is the subject of my new book, the betrayal, um, was kind of a, um, it was a one-off <laughs> in the office. It was, it was much more long-term is much more, um, a money laundering, follow the money, technical. So it, it had it, its little bumps in, in, in ways along the line um, within DEA, but and it it was something I was desperate to do to try to pull up the curtain on the financial the the people serving the underworld in the financial markets. Yeah, yeah. So who was Operation Promo sort of targeting, and what was the overall kind of goal of that operation? We were targeting the Cali Cartel. And the money laundering um, leaders of of that operation, very similar to Operation Sea Chase, that focused on the Medellin cartel. By this point in time, the Cali cartel had moved mm. into the position. We're talking, oh, two years before Pablo Escobar was killed. I was beginning my undercover operation in. Uh, in in promo and there was a battle going on uh, within the colombian cartels for control of the biggest chunk of the cocaine trafficking in the cali cartel was on the rise and quickly became more powerful uh, than the medellin cartel so them and there were a few specific players within the panamanian underworld who we also targeted um, uh, in the operation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I urge people to read your book, The Betrayal, because it is fantastic, and it really goes into great detail about that and uh, all the sort of trials and tribulations and dramas associated with that operation. Um, but uh, it's a really fascinating read. It's, um, you know, I've been sort of reading it sort of for the last sort of few days, and um, I feel like I've kind of gone into a whole other world now. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So, um, I, I, you know, you probably guess I'm a bit of a, a fan of sort of uh, the movies and TV shows about sort of undercover operations. So I'm sort of fascinated by the kind of mechanics of them. And I was just wondering if I could ask you some sort of general questions about how undercover operations sort of work. So I suppose my first question would be, are there kind of any hard and fast rules for when you begin an undercover operation? Yeah, well, it's going to depend upon the type of undercover operation. As I mentioned, DEA is somewhat tactical. And so they often are involved in short-term undercover operations that informally are called by bust operations, where they may have an informant who's decided to cooperate in an organization and the local Mr. Big is the main target and the undercover agent uh, is brought in as a potential buyer or seller. 
uh, or a transporter. And um, you maybe have four or five UC meets, undercover meets, and, and you work toward a bust. Um, and in those, there are some very, very important safety rules on coverage um, that really need to be adhered to because the risks are very high. You don't really know that as much about the targets. Um, you're trying, you're pushing to try to get an actionable uh, event to occur for a takedown. So, so that requires much more surveillance, much more coverage. Um, in a long-term operation, that is, should be, in my view, approached totally differently. You begin the operation with a written plan. Now there is a written plan in the, in the other, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's like reading cliff notes. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas in this, you're reading gone with the wind <laughs> and, and um, you, you really have to think of every possible aspect of the undercover operation from who your targets are. What is your access? Why is it feasible? What are your resources? What is your anticipated time length that you're going to be involved? What type of um, recording equipment are you going to be using? Who's going to be in charge of oversight and auditing? Mm. What is the management structure? Mm. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. And each of those is listed in this very detailed yeah. plan. If it's approved, now you need to use someone who has gone through under long-term undercover school training and who has been sufficiently backstopped so that you will be able to over a longer period of time maintain credibility because you know full well that these are smart targets who are going to be doing their homework to determine whether or not you are who you say you are so um so in that regard they're they're totally different from the standpoint of safety, uh, when I'm in a long-term undercover operation, as I was two times, and each of them was a little bit, one, one was two, the other one was a little more than two years, I can't have surveillance covering me 24-7. I'm embedded. I'm, I'm getting inside the organization. Um, bad enough when you're talking about a money laundering operation, as you begin to succeed and couriers begin to deliver a million, two million. Um, the tactical side of law enforcement wants to do as much surveillance as possible on the couriers who are dropping off the cash because their concept is that there is a tremendous benefit in identifying them. And then from an electronic standpoint, monitoring them and then determining where they fit in. And it's kind of like a separate investigation that they want to do. Well, that's all well and good. But if you put so much surveillance on the street, when money's being delivered to one of my couriers or to my office, you're now, you better be mindful that these people are going to be doing counter surveillance. And you better make sure that you take every precaution not to be burned, not to be identified, because if you are, you're going to get me killed. I don't have people on top of me, protecting me 24 seven, we can't. But unfortunately, that is what happens more often than not in these money laundering undercover operations. Um, you know, when I was really close to a lot of big guys in the uh, uh, Medellin cartel, they said to me, uh, Bob, you need to make sure that when your guys are out there receiving money, you need to be looking for any, they used to call them los feos, the ugly ones. And, uh, and I knew mm, they meant, mm. and, and he's, they said, you know, they're all, they, they generally, they are gringos. They're Cauc Caucasians. They are, uh, in their late twenties and early thirties. They wear blue jeans, pullover shirts with collars that are solid color, fanny packs, jogging shoes. That's what you need to be looking for. So, after I had been in Europe for two weeks in negotiations with Pablo Escobar's principal lawyer and consigliere, um, we now had been told we'd be receiving 
uh, as much as a hundred million dollars, but you don't get it all at once. You get like a, a million one day, two million the next, that kind of thing. And, um, so I, I hardly ever went into the office to try to stress to the surveillance people about the issues. And I did this time in New York and I got in and there was a room full of gringos between their late twenties and early thirties with jeans, pullover shirts, solid color, jogging shoes and fanny packs, because that's where their guns were. And I said, you know, this is what they're looking for, guys. Of course, they get offended. They're New Yorkers. Come on. So, <laughs> oh, you don't know anything about us in New York. We know what we're doing. We've been doing this for decades, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so now we're doing our thing. And um, so, Gerardo Moncada, for your listeners who want to find out about him, the last two segments of the first year's series of Narcos talk about Gerardo Moncada and Fernando Galeano. Those were my two principal clients when I was in the Medellin, working with the Medellin cartel. So Moncada's in the background and another guy, uh, a money broker is there and my partner is on the phone. And as my partner told me, he hears the screaming in the background that I, that Musella has to be a DEA undercover agent because we saw all the, the feds were out there. We saw them, we saw their cars. And, um, and so now I have to talk my way out of that because it's, ooh, I'd say it was probably three months before the October takedown. <laughs> um, and so a lot of different nuances between short term, you know, I guess in, in school, they call them short term, medium term, long term. Um, but, um, short term, the more, the closer you get to short term, you're more tactical. The more you get to long term, you know, you're talking more of embedding and, um, and virtually living with these people, um, as you try to record as much as you possibly mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Can you talk just a little bit about some of the sort of legal challenges of undercover work? Excellent question. And it's something I'm going to be drilling into the minds of the uh, students in the undercover school when I go mm. there in June. Um, first of all, you, when you're putting together your, uh, and, and this doesn't have to do with legal as much as it's something that they really need to know, but when you're going to put your undercover identity together, the, as much of it as you can do on your own, Rather than accepting things from headquarters, the better off you are. My, my story on that is that I had a passport that was illegal. It had phony stamps in it. And uh, I tried to convince them that we should just get the real stamps put in it. But they said, no, the FBI lab is really, really talented. Until I went through Heathrow and one of the brightest uh, immigration officers I've ever unfortunately had to deal with looked at my passport and said, Where'd you get the phony chops, mate? And I said, uh, what? <laughs> so, so there's, there's a little lesson, but, um, you, you have to realize that, um, the day of reckoning is going to come when a microscope is going to be put on your actions. And you need to realize that one of the typical defenses is a lack of predisposition by the person who then gets charged, meaning that the government overreached and entice them into doing things that they never otherwise would have ever, ever done. It was entrapment. It was the agent provocateur. And, and so, um, what you, you need to recognize is that the number of times that you reach out to a bad guy to kind of get things moving along is going to be well documented because you're going to be recording all of your telephone conversations that you possibly can and or writing them up in a report. And there's a thing called transaction analysis that defense attorneys do where they'll take those and they'll put them, all the ones that are initiated by the government are on one side and they're in red. And all the ones by my client are on the other side are green. And let me tell you, if 90% of the time the government is reaching out to the person to get to the end where the arrest occurs, that gets across to a jury pretty quickly. They understand that. And I, I stress to officers, too, that they have to recognize from day one that they're going to be on a witness stand. And they better recognize that anything and everything that they do is going to be witnessed, at least in the United States, by 12 people who are everyday citizens. And if you talk 
in a way that is degrading, if you act in a way that's degrading, if your relationship between you and your informant comes across in their eyes as buddy, buddy, and that, you know, this is a joke and you, you, you celebrate at the time of the arrests and, and this is not something that you are necessarily taking seriously, all of that works to the advantage of, you know, the defense. If you record, you better make sure that the authorizations are in place for the recording to be legal. If you're going to a foreign country, there are rules and regulations that you need to meet. When I went to the UK, um, Her, Her Majesty's Customs and Excise, it was at the time that we were wor working with, they handled all of the uh, sides to get the judge's approvals, you know, on, uh, on those sides. Um, I think what, what's most important is that, that, and also you need to make sure that your informant is under control because if you have unrecorded, unreported contact between your informant and the defendants and you can't explain what really happened other than through the testimony of the informant whose motive needs to be clearly identified well in advance. If it's revenge, because there's some reason that the informant thinks that the bad guy had done something bad to him, that's, that's something that a jury can quickly assess to be motivation enough to try to trick them into believing that the person is really, really guilty. Um, you know, agents are well trained in, in what the law is with respect to the probable cause that's, that's needed. God forbid you ever put something in a search warrant, um, or a, an affidavit for a wiretap that is not true. And you know, it's not true in the United States. It's called um, the, the, uh, the case is Frank's. So it's, it's a Frank's, uh, violation. And so if you can prove that the person intentionally put something illegal or untrue in an affidavit, the judge can then rule all of the fruits of the crime that were obtained through the wiretap or by the search are excluded and cannot be introduced in evidence. They were illegally obtained. Um, attorney client privilege is something they, that, that agents need to be aware of because in these cases, oftentimes a bad guy is a lawyer, but if they're a lawyer who is doing quote legal work and not legal work, um, there's a very delicate way to go about number one, getting the authorization to even deal with them, um, which in, in this case would require an attorney general of the United States approving. But number two, um, if you if you execute a search warrant, there are records in there that are records of account of, of clients that didn't commit crimes that are privileged. And if you just go willy nilly in there and take them and violate the attorney client privilege between those sovereign <laughs> clients, so to speak, you're going to taint the entire search. And, and and I have executed search warrants on offices of attorneys who were involved in both legal and illegal means. And there is a step-by-step -step process that you need to go through that has on site a prosecutor who is a China wall between what's taken and what's not taken um, from that location as identified by the agents that are on site. And again, if you, if you, if you violate that, um, you, you're not going to be able to use the fruits of the crime and you're probably going to be liable, uh, for some type of civil action that, that, that's going to be gone, gone on. So, um, Anyway, there's there's a myriad of things yeah. from a legal perspective yeah. that you, you need to keep in mind. No, definitely. Can you talk to us about the delicate art of working with informants? Yes. The one major thing that I always tell everybody is an informant is not your friend. Mm. The art is not to make them perceive that you think of them as untrustworthy or a lesser person, mm. but knowing in your own mind they are untrustworthy and a lesser person. 
Um, you don't want them to become the key witness in your case. So first, you need to fully vet them. So many times, informants shop agencies, and they may have worked for another agency, and then maybe they are bringing the same information to two agencies to see if they can try to sell it. Maybe they have committed acts working for another agency that has caused them to be what we call in the law enforcement world blackballed and prevented from working in anymore as an informant. So your homework starts, they come in, they tell you their story. Um, you've got to vet them and you better vet them really, really well. And, and I've, I, I give out a handout of all the things, what you should be asking, what you need to be researching. So now let's assume we've got a person who's there mm. and, um, now, you, in, the, in the course of this, let's figure out what's their motivation. That's extraordinarily important. The best possible thing is their motivation is money. Because what you're going to be telling them is, guess what? Unless we succeed in this operation, your rightful reward will not be received. And so what we do every single day is either going to cause us to build a case as we would build a house on rotten wood or strong wood. And if it's on rotten wood because you did things that you were not supposed to be doing and you acted in ways that you're not supposed to be doing, that's going to rot the wood and guess what? You're not going to get paid. So number one, you better realize that you better follow every single thing that I tell you to do and there should be no secrets between us whatsoever. Now, what favors are they asking for? In addition, some of them come in and they want to be, um, they, they want their assets to not be seized. Um, you know, I know where there have been times when that has been allowed, but you know, you don't make that decision as an agent. Um, you don't deal with an you know, sometimes you, you deal with an informant by accident and there's only you there. You, you need to strive to have two officers present anytime you're dealing with an informant, especially if they are of the opposite sex. But you want to have, make sure you've got a second officer who's there. Every single thing that you do and say with this, with this informant needs to be put on paper. There's no such thing as, it wasn't important, so I didn't write it up. Now, my boss would punch me in the nose if I wrote up that my informant called me and said that his son was sick and he was going to have to cancel the appointment. Um, but I kept a book for each informant. And if there was something that occurred that didn't go down on paper that the agency had, it was in my book. If I ran to him, ran into him in the hall and he was going to see somebody else, mm -hmm. I don't care what it was. It's mm -hmm. going in my book because at some stage I'm also going to sit down. That's my, that's my, my pattern. I can look at to see whether or not is, you know, is there something else that's going on here? Um, so, so that's extraordinarily important. Um, you need to get, in my view, you need to convince the informant. See, they are, they're kind of like, uh, trained like Pavlov's dog, they think that the more meetings they have with the bad guys and the more evidence they collect, the more money they're going to get paid. And I tell them the exact opposite. I tell them this, the quicker you get my undercover agent in with you and credibly to take over the position that you've had and we figure out a way to withdraw you, I'm going to be all for you getting the highest possible reward you possibly can because what you've done is you've caused us to have a credible witness, not somebody who's going to get up there and say, yes, I used to be a drug dealer. Yes, I did this. Yes, I, I, I did whatever horrible things, you know, they wound up doing. And yes, I'm in line to get a $10 million payment if, if this case uh, re results in a conviction. You know, that's not what you want. <laughs> you, you want the officer up there, you know, who's, who's talking about these things. So, um, 
you know, there, there's, there are many, many tricks. And that's one of the, the classes that I, I uh, or one of the topics that I address with uh, law enforcement officers. There's about eight or nine different things that you need to do in order to protect yourself against what traditionally is done by defense attorneys to try to attack the agency and to attack the credibility of the undercover agent in the eyes of the jury. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Well, operational security is obviously a huge deal on an undercover operation. Um, How do you protect yourself against potential bad apples in law enforcement? Well, since I was a victim of a bad apple, I guess I'm not the best person to give that advice. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm sure you've learned some big lessons from it, though. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, I almost learned the final lesson. (laughs) So, uh, (laughs) um, yeah, you know, the hardest thing that any law enforcement officer can seem to wrap their minds around is the concept that one of their own is dirty. I have seen personally things said and done that would cause any other person to realistically be suspected of illegal activity, but because it's a cop, Mm. yep, they get another chance. Mm. And um, from operational security, you know, once we, (laughs) uh, the best operational security I have ever Mm. been a part of is once we realized that one of the officers involved in the story of the betrayal was in fact dirty, we got our group together. My boss and his boss came in and said, I don't care who it is. We are not telling anybody in any other agency Anybody in this office, I don't want you telling your cat, we have to keep this operational security at the highest. We have three months. We're going to continue the undercover operation and we're going to make the decisions within our own group about how it is we're going to maximize getting evidence that'll put this person away for the longest period of time. I needed to stay um, undercover in part because part of our plan was for me to feed him misinformation and to see that misinformation show up in the bad guy world, which it did. Um, and, and there were many other ways in which we took advantage of that during the last three months of the undercover operation, but operational security, um, is, is a weakness and there's more corruption within US law enforcement than the public ever really gets to appreciate because the natural instinct of agencies is to sweep it under the rug as quickly as possible because they don't believe the public is mature enough to recognize that this isn't an agency problem, it's an individual problem. And I've seen cases pled out where an agent should have gotten much more time, but was given a slap on the wrist, uh, maybe a two-year sentence. Um, So that's like a year in prison and some time in a Salvation Army uh, work release. and, and, And one article that comes out and says, you know, that this happened. And instead of a long drawn out trial and, um, and something of of real magnitude. Mm-hmm. So um it's kind of a self it's a self-defeating thing. You know, I don't I don't want the the public to lose confidence in law enforcement, but I want anybody who commits an act of corruption to pay the highest possible price that they can. And in our case, the officer got an eleven year prison sentence. And that in hindsight was probably an appropriate sentence. In your book, you comment that the war on drugs and crime is failing. Can you talk to us about your recommendation to improve things? I think that um, what we do on the supply side, some of it is excellent Mm. and some of it is horrible. The excellent portion um, I see done by segments of the DEA and other agencies. In the DEA's case, um, a, a unit called the Special Operations Division, which I think has three groups, about 45 or so agents. Um, they go after the biggest of the big 
they use extraterritorial statutes that allow them to go and pluck somebody out of Thailand or wherever they want to go grab them because they can prove that they were involved in a conspiracy that was going, the goal of which was to send drugs to the streets of the United States. So they do great work and we need to, you know, um, Ukraine has given us a wonderful example of the importance of taking out command and control, you know, killing as many Russian generals as they have that disrupts the ability of the troops in the field to be able to act efficiently when you get rid of that experience. And so that's why it's important to cut the heads of the snakes off in the cartels and in the drug world and in organized crime. But too often, and this happened to me several times while I was at DEA, the agency recognizes that the resources that they are given by Congress are fueled by a superficial review of the number of arrests and seizures conducted by the agency, which elected officials erroneously think is some indicator of the efficiency Mm -hmm. of the agency. So anytime you want to get at least, if not more, you better make sure, according to some management personnel in agencies, not just DEA, I'm not picking on them, but they want to make sure that they've got those numbers. So end of fiscal years in October, I can't count the number of Septembers that boss would come in and go, I don't care what you're working on, drop it, get over to the local agencies, adopt as many of their their drug cases as you can, let's get them in the federal system. And um, we need to get the numbers up. Um, you know, that does exactly what has happened in, two, I guess, in 2021. I think it was 1.8 million people in prison. Um, you, you know, a lot of the people who there maybe deserved to be treated for their illness of drug uh, abuse that led them to committing lower level drug crimes. Um, and, and that leads me to we need to balance the application of resources given to the supply side with an equal amount to the demand side and maybe even more to the demand side. And when I say that, I don't just mean for drug education and drug treatment. I also mean for enabling a true um, advanced either academic education or technical education for people who are in underserved, underprivileged communities, of which there are countless numbers uh, in the United States. And, you know, when I try to speak to some people who are on the far right about the importance of enabling people with who are so underprivileged and underserved to have an equal opportunity at education they start calling me a socialist and I, you know, I, I don't care what you want to call me. I see the problem. There will be supply. And I was told this by Roberto El Cayeno, who was played in the movie by Benjamin Bratt, who said, Bob, as long as there's a demand, there will be a supply. And he just looked at it like he was bringing widgets in. He never used cocaine. Um, but we need to recognize the fact that we need to help people. I'm, uh, it, it breaks my heart to say it, but you know, I have two cousins who died of overdoses of heroin. I'm sorry. And I have one cousin who um, about four years ago um, was on the very edge of doing the same again. And I tried to help. Uh, and this is after he stole money from my mom. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah. I tried to help. I eventually was able to identify a vacant bed offered by the city and county in which he was located. Um, The resources for beds are way, way short of what's needed. And and ultimately, that didn't even resolve the problem. Thankfully, he found a faith-based program that turned him around and um, and has now put him in a position of being a resource for that faith-based program. Uh, charity that helps people who had the same illness he had before. So we need to be working a lot harder on that side. We also need to allow zero tolerance for corruption. Any t- sort of corruption that raises its ugly head needs to be pounded into the ground. Um, and lastly, we need to stop 
trying to address some way to subdue the involvement of financial institutions by the technique we use, which is to identify that they've committed these their involvement in moving illicit funds and then fining them. That's ridiculous. You fine them? You, what does that do? It penalizes the shareholders of the bank and the individuals who carry these acts out are not being held personally responsible. Personal responsibility for the illicit acts that are committed by people in the financial markets must be given a very, very high priority. Believe me, when we put BCCI senior executives and even handcuffs on a board member of the seventh largest privately held bank in the world, the financial markets and those who were involved in it saw that and it had an impact. But all these fines, I I don't think they have really um, an impact at all. It's a cost of doing business. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up today? I, I wrote my book, The Betrayal, to be what one fellow with PwC who I know said it's edutainment. <laughs> um, it's an education and it's entertaining. And I didn't want to give yeah. up the education. And I knew that by putting in very um, specific information that would be of benefit to people who work in the private sector, in the compliance world, in the banking world. Um, I was taking away room for a lot of the bang, bang, shoot 'em up uh, stuff that thrill readers are looking for. Um, and, um, and so uh, I apologize to those thrill readers. If they want, I can send them what's on the cutting room floor that, <laughs> that had to come out. But, um, but I, I'm, I'm most interested in, in trying to have what I write to be edutainment um, because um, the public paid for my, my journey as a, a federal agent and my journey in the underworld. Um, so many decades have gone by that what I witnessed that I can tell you about um, does not undermine national security. There's no big secrets here. Um, and my feeling is that the public paid for finding out about that, and I want to tell them. So um, I, I hope that they find it um, educational as well as entertaining. Mm. Yeah, well, they should. I certainly did. So, uh, yeah, it's an excellent book. Thank you. Where can listeners find out more about you and your work? Probably the best place is my website, which is simply my name with no space in between, Robert mm. Mazur, M-A-Z-U-R dot com. Uh, there's all sorts of information in there about um, – the infiltrator. Um, there's a separate uh, road to go down for all all kinds of information about the betrayal, plus articles that I've written, articles that have been written about me, um, my my speaking engagements, what I normally cover, and and which organizations I've had the honor of addressing. Um, I just recently came back from uh, Frankfurt, and um, I had the opportunity to speak to the board. Uh, of Fidelity Investment. And I mean, that's an institution that oversees about $1.3 trillion. And um, it's good to get access to people who are at the very top, because oftentimes they don't get the opportunity to see this, the grit of reality. And, and I'm really thankful that they had the uh, the interest um, and gave me that opportunity. But there are times when I talk to groups of two to 4,000 uh, people at uh, conventions that where where people are trying to perfect their talents as uh, compliance specialists. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time today. I've really enjoyed the chat. I I have as well. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies.